Well, we've been in a series that we've entitled Show Up Fool. Now, I know some of you, it's your first time with us today, and so let me give you just kind of the background, like what we're after in this, in this series. There is a, sometimes we live with a disconnect between what we read in God's word and what we're living in our lives. Anyone ever experienced that disconnect? Like there's what God's word says and what we amen on Sunday, but then there's like what I'm living on Monday. So you'll read in places like Ephesians, and oh, I don't know if my TV's working, but Ephesians, we'll read in places like Ephesians, Oh, good. Look at that. Ephesians chapter 3, it says this. And it's Paul's prayer for you and I. He's saying, I pray that, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. Remember this. We're going to come back to it, okay? That Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And he goes on to say this, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. And again, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But here's his prayer ultimately. That you may be filled. Someone say filled. So God's desire for you is to be filled. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I, I, love, I, love, I love scripture. Paul's just like, I, I don't want you filled, just filled with all the fullness of God. Are, are filled with the fullness of God. You're filled with all the fullness of God. This is, this is so filled with the fullness of God that like, if someone bumps you, you're going to get some on you. You know what I mean? I'm just so full. And God wants you living like that. So we read that on Sunday morning. We're like, that sounds great. I want that. Amen. But then we show up on Monday to work, and it's just, maybe we're not living there. Maybe we're not connecting with words like fullness. We're connecting with words like brokenness. We're connecting with words like, uh, like restlessness, discontentedness. But yet, Scripture says in, in John, it, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he goes on to say, but I have come that you might have life and life to the Full, that's in John. And so there's just this constant wrestle between what I'm living and what I'm reading, what I'm living and what I'm reading, right? And what we've been trying to do in this series is go, come on, everybody. You can actually live a full life. You can. And we've just been trying to get, away, get out of the way everything that stands in the way. And so here's what we've talked about. We've talked about the fact that we need to live we need to stop doubting and start trusting. Like we just live with some faith. We put faith in God's word. God said it, I believe it. Amen? That's gonna help you live a full life. God said it, I believe it. I'm gonna believe him over what the enemy says. I'm gonna believe what God says over what the world says. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand on God's word. Come on, someone say amen. Like I put faith in God's word. So uh, that's week one. Week two, we said, you know what? We're gonna have a life of faith. Then we're gonna have a life of thankfulness. Right? We talked about that last week. Like, like, you are already surrounded by everything you need to live a full life. The problem might be that you're just not recognizing it, that you're not thanking God for it. Come on, God has blessed us, everybody. Amen? Like, we're, we're blessed already, right? Like, God has anchored me in heaven. That's all I need. Like, I just need to start thanking God. So we lived a life of faith. We lived a life of thankfulness. And here's the other thing. Here's what I'm talking to talk about today. You will live a full life. The way we live a full life is we've got to learn. We've got to learn to guard our hearts. You've got to learn to guard your heart. You know, I, I, I think a lot of people think that the potential in our life is directed by the circumstances of our life, okay? So my potential is built on or directed by, influenced by what happens to me or what's said to me, or, or, or the opportunities I get or I don't get. You see, it's all circumstantial things. It's the things around me that direct my life. But you know, God actually says that our life is not ultimately directed by what's happening to you. It's directed by what's happening inside of you. And so all sorts of things can happen to you, but if you've got the right things happening inside of you, the things that happen to you can't stand a chance because what's happening inside of you is actually stronger than what's happening to you. It's bigger than, see, the pressure of the world is gonna push on you and what was said is gonna come into you and the circumstance and the stock market crashes and this happens and that, and all these things are happening to me. But scripture says there's a way you can live that there's so much strength all up inside of you that when that pressure comes upon you, you, you can stand strong. You don't buckle, you don't break, you see, because my life is not ultimately directed by my circumstance. And what's happening in my world is directed by what's happening in my heart. So that's what Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Watch. 
Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. And that's what we're talking about today. You've got to learn. If you're going to live a full life, you've got to guard your heart. Why is that so important, God? With all diligence, for out of it, out of it, out of it, not out of your circumstance, not out of what was said about you, not, about, not out of what was done to you, not a, no, out of it, out of your heart spring the issues of life. Everything springs from here, you see. Now, yes, if you can allow, if you allow what happened to you to affect what's happening inside of you, then you're right. It might mess with you. But if I can filter what's happening to me through what God wants to do inside of me, man, nothing can touch me. You see, I've got, I've got a, a strong heart. I've been diligent to guard my heart. So my life then, watch, and this is so important, my life then is not dictated or directed by the things I cannot control. Do you understand that? Some people, we live in this, we live in this way where we allow ourselves to be, and I understand the world throws at us all sorts of things that are, that are oh, man, they, just unexpected and heartbreaking, but church, you don't have to live victim to the circumstances of this world. See, I can't control what they said to me. I can't control what's happened in the stock market. I can't control, you know, what the spouse did or what decision my, ki my kids might have made. I, I can't control all those things. And I want to tell you something, friends. God doesn't expect you to control all those things. But there's one thing you can control. It's your heart. And, and, and now, watch, if I understand that, my life's not then directed by the things I can't control. It's shaped by the one thing I can control, my heart. So, so, what's happening inside of us is more important than what's happening around us. I'm going to say that again because you need to write it down. About four people wrote that down. I saw that. Listen, we need about all of us writing that down. What's happening inside of us is more important than what's happening around us. I promise you. That's why you can see people walk through the worst circumstances imaginable and come out on the other side of it better than they went into it. Why? Because while they were in it, they had more happening inside of them. They guarded their heart. They, they, were, they, were, uh, they were wise concerning their heart. They were wise concerning their faith in the middle of whatever circumstance they might have been facing. And I know a lot of you walk in here facing all sorts of circumstances and all sorts of situations in your life. But I want you to understand this. God's eye is still on you. He has not left you. He sees you, and he wants to walk with you through whatever life is thrown at you. God is not abandoning you. Come on, he's, he's on your side. So, God is always desiring to work. He's always desiring to pull you forward into your greatest potential. So Jesus tells a parable to help us understand the disconnect between what it is God wants to do and what it is sometimes we see happening. And so over in the book of Luke, chapter 8, Jesus uses the illustration of a sower that goes out to sow some seeds. And I love Jesus. Whenever he's telling a story, I always picture that he's probably talking about a sower throwing seeds because there was probably a sower throwing some seeds. And so he says, imagine a sower goes out to sow seeds. And there's a guy off in the distance just throwing seeds. And this is what he says in Luke 8, 5 through 8. He says, a farmer goes out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path. Someone say the path. So some falls on this path. It's where all these people have been walking. And because they've been walking there, it's, all, it's hard and it's compacted. And that seed can't actually take root. And so it just kind of sits there on the path. And it says, because it was sitting there on the path, it says it was trampled on. And the birds of the air ate it up. Then it goes on to say this. Some fell on the rocky ground. Some say rocky ground. Rocky ground. And when it came up, so it starts to grow. It says that the plants withered because they had no moisture. In other words, they, they didn't take root. They, they couldn't grab the moisture from the seed it was, or from the soil because it was so rocky. And so they couldn't get what they needed to live because there were some rocks in the way. Okay, So those plants withered because they had no moisture. It says other seed fell among the thorns. Some say the thorns. And the thorns. So the seed grows up. Uh, and they grew up with it, and they, they choked out the plant. There was some things growing alongside this, this, this seed that shouldn't have been, and those things ended up choking out the life that that seed could have brought. And then it says this. Still other seed fell on good soil. Some say good soil. Good soil. Some seed fell on good soil, and it came up, and it yielded a crop. 
a hundred times more than what was sown. A hundred times more. Do you know how much potential is in a seed? You look at a seed and you're like, it's just a seed. But in that seed is a tree. And in that tree is multiple trees. In that, in that one seed is a whole grove of fruit. There's so much potential inside this seed. The disciples start talking to themselves. and They're like, do you know what he's saying? Because that doesn't make any sense to me. And so they pull Jesus aside. And they're like, Jesus, can you please just break it, like break it down, put it where we understand it. What are you talking about? What is this illustration all about, the seed and the soil and, and all this? Can you, can you break it down? So Luke chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus says this. He goes, okay, listen, here's what it is. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed that was scattered and that landed on the rocky, the, the hard ground and the rocky ground and the, and the, the, the weeded ground, that, like the, the seed is the word of God. Now, when we hear that, modern day Christians, we think of the Bible. We think of God's word given to us. And that is true because the word of God is the word of God. But when a Hebrew, when the audience of that day was listening to Jesus say that the seed is the word of God, they did not just think about God's word as his written word. They thought about God's word as his activity. So let me, let me help you understand this. The word of God in their mind wasn't just the voice of God. It was the activity of God. So that's why you would see in, in, in passages like Psalm 33, 6. What, look at it with me. Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord. By the word of God, the heavens were made and all that hosts of them. And by his breath of his mouth, they were made. So they'd hear the word of God and they'd say, oh, that's the activity of God. That's the working of God in this planet. It's the working of God in this world. It's by his word the heavens were made. Big Bang Theory, God spoke and bang it happened, right? So it's his word that brought forth the, the universe. And they understood that. They saw his word as, well, active. Um, I want you to understand God is constantly speaking over his, there's, there's, his word is active. God is constantly active in the lives of people. He's right now, in this very moment, please listen to me, God is working in your life. Like he's, he is active in your life. God is always speaking. He's always um, shaping. He's, he's never wasting a moment. So like this moment becomes a holy moment, doesn't it? Because this moment isn't just a moment where you're listening to me. This moment is a moment where the Spirit of God is, is meeting with you. And he's wanting to work. When you leave here today and you go out and, and you face circumstances, situations, it, listen, those can become holy moments and situations because in those situations, God is with you wanting to work and to speak and to shape and to maneuver. God, God, God is constantly building. The Bible says this, that, that the, the church is his, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will build the church. What's he doing all the time? He's building the church. He's constantly working. You with me? See, that's the activity of God, the word of God. That seed in this parable is representing the activity of God on this planet. It's the moving of God upon the earth, the moving of God in your life. And so the sower is out casting the seed. Now, here's a question for you. We all know that that seed has radical potential, like every seed has. When we don't end up living in full potential... It's not the seed that has the problem. You follow that? So, so what's the issue? If the seed doesn't have the problem, like, like God's activity is perfect. God's word is perfect. God, God does what God does, and, it's, and, it, and, and, and nothing stands in his way. God, I mean, the seed has all the potential in the world. The, the, so if I'm not living in the fullness of life that God's called me to live in, if I'm not experiencing the potential that's actually there for me, then I, I've got to come to this conclusion that the issue is not with the seed. The issue is not with God. So, so what's the issue? Well, the issue is with the soil. Well, what's the soil? The soil is the attitude of our hearts. The soil is the condition of man's heart. So listen, if the problem is not on God's end, everybody. It never will be. God is good. God does work. God, 
The, the problem is never on God's end. The problem is often that it's, it's on our end. It's the soil. It's the condition of my heart. And so if that's true, which it is, then I better learn to pay attention to my soil. I got to learn to pay attention to my heart. And what you'll find is, as Jesus points out to us in this parable, is that every, every human heart is going to find itself in one of four conditions. And the seed will produce or not produced based upon what condition my heart happens to be in. So here's my question for you this morning, church. How's your heart? How you doing? Like what's going on on the inside of you? Because that matters more than anything happening around you right now. So what are these conditions of the heart? Jesus actually goes on to explain it for us, and I'm glad he did. He's like, Jesus, you talked about this trampled ground. Like, tell me about that. And so in Luke chapter 8, verse 12, it says this. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. This is those along the path. He says, let me explain to you who they are. This condition of the heart. It's the, you can write this down, it's the hard heart. It's the hard heart. So the, the seed is scattered. Like God shows up to work. He, he brings his word and the, the potential lands upon the surface of your life. But listen, that path, it's really interesting. That, that path, well, what do you do on a path? Well, you walk on a path, don't you? you, you it's just that the seed there gets trampled. And, and if people are walking on a path over and over again, then, then that soil would become compacted and, and hard. And, and when the seed would land on that soil, it wouldn't go in because the, the, the soil was just so compact and it was so hard. And I think today some of us come into this moment that's filled with so much potential. We get around the things of God and there's so much potential. But we find ourselves with a hard heart because we're like this path. You see, we've got a hard heart. And we show up to church, and it's because, you know, maybe someone forced you. Well, they can't force you. They just promised to buy you lunch after church today. So here you are. You're in church, and you told me, go buy me lunch. And you're sitting here counting down the moments. I can't wait to get out of here. You're just hard heart. I, is the preacher done yet? Man, how long is this going to take? It's like, yeah, yeah. Just hard heart. You got your back kind of turned toward God. And I hope it's worth it. I hope this lunch is worth it today, you know. Man, he's better be good. And we just sit there, just kind of, man, just, I'm not, I'm not going to even allow God's word or this environment to, to affect me at all, you see. You count down the moments. Now, I don't know what caused it. Like, how'd you get there? Like, why are you so bent out of shape? I, I think for some of us, maybe you've been trampled on. So he says that the path was hard because it's a path. People are walking all over it. And some of you come in, and the reason your heart is hard today is because you feel like you've been walked on a little bit, maybe. You know who's really good at walking on people? It's like them church people. You ever meet them church people? Come on, you know. You meet them church people that just walk on people. They just, they're always, they come in as a little, you know, on the little high horse, and they kind of trample on everybody else, just kind of, we're better than everybody else, and you're standing there, there you are, just kind of, I'm better than you, and you stand in line behind me at, at, at Trader Joe's, and how dare you say that? I heard you. We don't use those words in our home, and stuff on, get you, and, and, and maybe you grew up in a home, like, they say they love God, but they came home, and they, they just kind of put their foot down all over you, kind of just... And pretty soon you find you're getting stepped on all the time. I went to, I tried church one time, but then I did something wrong and they made sure everyone knew about it. And you just find yourself just, you just, you show up and you're just like, I don't, been there. I'm not even gonna try. I got a hard heart. I've been walked all the time. You tell yourself, man, I, I get picked on enough by the Christians I do meet in public. I'm never going to their headquarters. <laughs> like, why would I put myself through that, right? And someone got to promise you lunch, get you to church, just so you can sit in a moment like this and listen to me tell you, I am so sorry. I am so sorry you've been treated like that. That's not how Jesus treats people. That's, that's, not, that's not his heart. That is not what the church is supposed to do. And on behalf of every church that's ever treated you that way, any Christian that's ever looked down at you and stepped on you because of what you believe or where you come from or what you're wrestling with or what you, come on, I just need you to know that that's not Jesus. Jesus is the one that kneels down to meet with you, to love on you, to care for you. He, 
And so I don't know why you have a hard heart, friend. Maybe, maybe you've been through some stuff. Maybe, maybe you have some really traumatic experiences in your life that you've, you've actually blamed on God. Like, if God loved me, then why'd that happen? Friend, I need you to understand this, that, that this is a fallen planet. This is not the world as God intended it to be. This is the world as man has marred it. We messed it up. The, the, he, C.S. Lewis says, in the moment that we said, the moment that we turned from God. So in the garden, we said, God said, here's how I plan for you to live. And we said, no, thank you, God. We got our own path. The moment we turned from God, we unleashed the dogs of pain and sickness and death upon society. We did that. Like, why is there sickness and why is there disease? And why is it because we've been rebelling against God? But you know how good God is? He takes a rebellious people that he's so in love with, he hunts them down and anchors them back into a heaven that we don't deserve. He anchors us back into a life that we can never earn on our own because you see, he's gonna redeem it. He's like, you broke it, but I'm gonna fix it. That's what the cross is all about because he doesn't want to leave us in this place of brokenness, you see. And so, yes, something horrific may have happened in your life, but friends, don't blame God. Lean into God. Call out to God. Cry out to God. Like, just find yourself needing him now more than ever, you see. So the, the, the hard heart, and some of us are in here like that. And I want you to see something about the hard heart. It says that the hard heart, the seeds were scattered on, the, on that path of the hard heart, and that the birds of the air came and took the seeds away. The birds of the air in Scripture often represent the enemy, Satan. What Satan is doing, even now, to those who have a hard heart, is he is robbing you of your potential. Those seeds have potential. Your life has potential. It's just sitting right there on the surface of your life. And the enemy, if you have a hard heart, he's always going to rob you of your potential. And you feel it. You tell yourself things like this, like, like I, I know there's more to life than what I'm living right now. And, and you feel a little frustrated, and you feel like, you, like you just, man, I know there's got to be more to my story. And there is, friends. You've got to, if you have a hard heart, please listen, you've got to learn to soften your heart. Just take a step today. I know, I know it's been a long time. I know you, but I mean, just take a step of softening your heart. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 says this. Hosea 10 says, sow to yourself in righteousness, reap according to mercy, break up your fallow ground. Break up all those, those hard-hearted postures inside of you. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. You seek God. Till when? Till he is raining righteousness upon me. You see, and he promises to. Come on, church. Amen. We got the left side going today. Where's the rest of you? Just, so that's where some of us are. Well, Jesus goes on. Like the different postures of the heart. So we got the hard heart. Then he, then he introduces us to what I call the faint heart. In Luke 8, it goes on to say, Luke 8, 13. It says, those that were on the rocky ground are the ones who received the word with joy and when they heard it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but the time of testing comes and they fall away. So this is those, it's not the, not the trampled on ground. This is a little bit off the path and, and there's some rocky soil. The seed lands there and it says the, the ground receives it with joy. So you show up to church, you're like, I love this. Jesus is so good and I got the, a new Bible and I'm, I'm reading and I, I love this. And then you show up to, to life through the week, and you get hit by a trial, by a circumstance. The rug gets pulled out from underneath you. You lose your job. The kids do something dumb again. The spouse, I don't even want to go there. And there's just trial hits. And you leave church going, God, I love you. You're so good. Oh, God. And then you go, oh, God, where are you? God, you see, and this is the, the problem is that you received it with joy, but, but the Word of God is not actually taking root inside your life. You got some rocks in the way. You got, you got some, some issues that you got to work through in the way. And, and, and it's not allowing the potential of God to actually thrive inside your life. You're not taking root. Why? Well, these times of testing keep messing me up. So times of testing. James says that, he says, count it all joy when you enter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of your faith produces. So when you give your heart to God, you give your life to Jesus, you, you surrender to him, you need to know this, friends. You're gonna walk out of that moment 
wake up the next day and you still live in a broken planet, okay? I think a lot of Christians think you give your life to Jesus, all your problems goes away. They all go away. But you know, one of the promises that I don't see on a lot of uh, refrigerators is, is, you know, you put all your promises of God in your fridge. Put this one on, up there, right? In this world, you will have tribulation. You know, it's a promise of God. I don't see anyone claiming that. Thank you, God. I'm gonna have some tribulations today. No, no, no. But Jesus goes, hey, everybody, just so you know. Hey, I know, I know, I know you're excited. I know you, but you need to know that as you go out there, there's gonna be some issues. You see, you're gonna face issues. Christians and non-Christians face issues alike. But now listen to me, Christian, you're gonna face them different. Why? Oh, because now you got something happening inside of you that is far greater than anything this world can throw at you. See, now you actually have a foundation to stand on. Now you actually have, now you actually have footing. You see, you're, you're different. So, but you need to understand that. It's not that there's not going to be trials. It's that when the trials come, we got a different you walking into them. And you need to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, then the trials are going to take you out. That's what's happening here in this rocky ground. They start to grow, but then the trial takes them out. Because they just don't have footing. They don't have roots that say, ah, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. You know, my kids, when, when, when they were little, I'd walk into a room and they'd jump on me out of nowhere. And they'd wipe me out. I mean, all 40 pounds of Elias just poof, knock me over, right? Because I wasn't expecting it. You could, you, could, you could break your legs stepping off a curb if you're not watching it, right? But if you're ready, come on, if you're ready, someone say ready. Man, if I'm ready, bring it. I'll catch you. I can handle that curb. See, I can handle it. So what happens in this situation with, the, with this, what I call faint heart, is they're just not ready. They just don't expect it. I want to tell you guys, it's going to happen. But you're going to be okay. Because Jesus is with you in it. And how about this time? Someone say this time. So it's going to be different this time. This time when I face a trial, instead of backing down, I'm going to lean in. Instead of turning from God, I'm going to run to God. I'm going to choose, listen, I'm going to choose just to, I'm going to double down. Like, I'm in a trial right now. I'm going through something right now. You know, you know what I'm going to do? Tate, Tate and I, we, believe it or not, buddy, we've been through some stuff. We've been through some trials in our lives. And here's what I've found. As if I, oh, and I start doubting in God and where are you? And I go this route and I, I kind of lean. I will swirl and spin and, and it just gets the worst of me. But what we have found, let me let you in on a little secret. We pray all the time. We're always seeking God. You're like, good, I'm glad. You're pastor in the church. That sounds good. We're Glad to know our pastor prays. We do. But you know what happens when a trial comes? We look at each other and go, you ready? We're going to double down. Double down. What does that mean? It means we're not just going to pray. We're going to pray and fast. But it means we're not, we're not just going to get around God's people. I'm going to call right now. I got a list of about 10, 11 different that men in my life that when I get into something, I'm like, you're getting in this with me. I'm bringing you along. I need you praying for this. And here's what's happening. I'm going to double down. I'm going to double. Some say double down. So when the trial comes, instead of being wiped out, I'm doubling down. I'm putting roots down. I'm gonna, I'm, and here's what happens. Without fail, every single time, God uses what the enemy meant for evil, and he turns it for good. He turns it for good. He turns it for good. And he does it every single time. Every time. I mean, do you, do you understand that Jesus rose from the grave? Okay, look. Death could not hold him down. Okay, we're all there? If death can't stop Jesus, come on, friends. If, if death can't get in his way, your boss ain't going to get in his way. Your job's not going to get in his way. Like your co-worker, your family, your, they can't get in his way. So what you do, you don't, listen, you don't wander further from him in trial. You get up real close to him. Jesus, what are you doing right now? You want to turn left? Okay, I'm going left. Jesus, I'm going right, like, right? I'm not going to be one of these sheep just off like, what? No, no, I'm in a, in. Where was David? Remember in Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Why was God with him? Because David's like, I'm with you. <laughs> just staying close, just staying close, just staying close, just staying close. But you have to guard your heart from not just becoming faint of heart. So, so where you at? Some of it's the hard heart. There's so much potential right now, but you got a hard heart. It's, it's the faint heart. Like, there's so much potential, but just, I, just, I just check out. I don't double down. I... I, I Others of us, it's the, what I call the, the neglected heart. And I think it's a big one. Because I think, I think in, 
In our culture, we've convinced, a lot of us have uh, convinced ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right. But I think a lot of people who say they're doing all right are, are actually neglecting some things in their life. But we don't really admit it. We don't get honest with ourselves. And so we walk around pretending that we're doing okay. But really, we're neglecting the life that God's given us. So we're neglecting the heart that's inside of us. And I think a lot of us end, end up here. Tell, tell me if maybe this, this is you. In, in Luke chapter 8, verse 14, he, he describes the seed that fell among thorns. But the thorns stand for those who hear. Uh, those that fell among thorns stand for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked out by life's worries and riches and, and pleasures. And, 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 and they can never mature. So the seed starts to grow in their life because they're paying attention to it. But then there's other things that they're giving attention to and other things that, that are as valuable to them as the word and the work of God in their life. And they, they see all these things as equal. And so those things grow up with them. But watch, anything that you are feeding other than the uh, desires of God in your life will end up choking out God's work in your life. Does that make sense? So it's, there's weeds. A, a weed is anything in your life, a weed is anything that you're allowing to grow in your heart that shouldn't be growing in your heart. And it's, it's any, any lie from the enemy, oh, you'll be happier if you had this, you had this, and so you live your life chasing this, 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 when really you should just be running after God. This would be nice, but I don't need it. God's all I need. Like, what are the things you're allowing to, some, some of it's, it's, it's lusts and it's, it's, promiscuity and it's just I'm allowing things to grow in here that don't belong in here and soon those things start to kill what it is God wants to do in here so like I, I don't know about you but I'm in a constant battle in my yard with these things called weeds and specifically crabgrass anybody like crabgrass like it's everywhere and and here's what you got to do with crabgrass, right? When you see it, like you see something, you do something. I, I just got to, I got to pull it. And what I've discovered is if you, if you try to cheat it and you just sort of, you just kind of pull the top off it, it don't work. Like you've got to actually take it up by the root. Someone say the root. The root. Root, root, by the root. Colby, we're going to get them roots all up in there. By the root. So, watch. If I don't grab it and pull it up from the root, what happens? It grows right back. Right? Okay. So, watch. If you drive by my house and I just kind of start to go, ah, I'll deal with that one, but not that one, and that one, and I really, that one, I've become, I, I really like that one right there. That one, I mean, I'm, You'll drive by my house and go, what, what we say? You'll see my house and you go, that is a neglected yard. It is a neglected yard. There are, there is crabgrass all over the place. There are weeds all over the place. Just, it hasn't been taken care of, you see? And I think if we're not careful, watch. We do a little drive-by. And is there, any, is there a neglected heart? Is there, have there been things growing in your heart that shouldn't be growing in your heart? Have you allowed things to be there that shouldn't be there? Like, is there just a neglected heart? Well, friends... A neglected heart will never mature, okay? Never mature. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, entangles us. Since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, those that have gone before us, those that have paved the way, here's what we need to do. Here's what you respond. Lay aside every weight, Lay aside every sin that's been entangling you, that you could actually move on to maturity, that you could live the life that God has called you to live. I'm telling you, there's more for you if you would just be willing to take this serious, to stop neglecting your life and neglecting your heart, allowing things that shouldn't be allowed. And even as I'm talking about this right now, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about inside your life. There's that thing, like, oh no, he's talking about that thing. Yeah, we are talking about that thing. Don't neglect your heart. Don't neglect what it is God wants to do. 
I'll just say it to you this way. Maturity is getting us to this place where we decide that it's time to take this seriously. That it's time to go all in. Like, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take getting my family to church seriously. I'm gonna take getting my kids to church seriously. I'm gonna take building Christian community around my life seriously. I'm gonna, therefore, I'm gonna take getting into a crew seriously. I'm, I'm gonna take reading God's word and, and having his word inside my life every single day seriously. I'm, I'm gonna take spending time in God's presence every day seriously. I'm, I'm going to take this, I'm, I'm gonna go all in. And I do this every now and then throughout the year. I'll, I'll say something to this effect. I'll say, give me a year. I call it the one-year challenge. Say, give me a year of you just going all in, of you saying, all right, the doors are open, I'm there. There's a crew, I'm in it. A service project, sign me up. And you just go all in, and here's what I say. It's a money-back guarantee. God is gonna move in your life. And here's what I know is it won't even take a year. Here's what I know. You get two to three months in, and you're going, I never knew. And I cannot tell you how many stories are in this church of people who just said, okay, I'll go all in. Jasmine and others, there's so many others that said, I'm gonna go all in. And their life today is living in the potential that God had from all along. Because they were, listen, they said, I'm gonna stop neglecting my heart. So you have this condition of a heart, it's hard heart. There's a faint heart, just trials, throw them. There's this neglected heart. Now we're allowing things in our life that shouldn't be in our life. And, but then Jesus says that there's this, this last condition of a heart. And I'm gonna, call it the, I'm gonna call it the willing heart or the ready heart. It says the seed on the good ground stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word of God, they retain it, and by persevering, by persevering, they, they don't give up, they take it serious, they keep coming back, they, they press in, I, you can't stop me, right? I'm, I'm, I'm all in, they persevere, produce a crop. Goes on to say a, a hundredfold from that which was actually planted in their life. The, the good seed, you see, watch, it's the willing heart, it's the ready heart. That instead of having a hard and closed heart, it stays open, okay, God, I'm willing. That instead of falling away and questioning God, we're leaning in and we're trusting God. Instead of neglecting and, and filled with weeds, we're, we're caring for and protecting our heart. You know, I read in Ephesians earlier that Paul's prayer is that we'd be filled with all the fullness of God. But did you see the key? Did you notice the key to being filled with all the fullness of God? Let me show it to you in Ephesians. He says, I pray that you would, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. I think that's so important. This isn't just about an outward veneer. It's not about a show you put on. It's about a reality change inside of your inner man. The, the you behind the you, you show everybody else. The true you. You can be strengthened with might in your inner man. How? That Christ might dwell that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that Christ would dwell. You know what that word dwell means? Ready? Yeah, he'd just be at home. It means to settle down in your heart. The strength you're longing for, the change, the life, the fullness is found in the moment we allow Jesus just to be at home inside your heart. You ever, you ever have people show up to your house that you don't want in your house? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. And when they show up to your house and you don't want them in your house, you gotta, you gotta wait. Here's what you, we got all sorts of little tricks. Help me out if you're with me, right? They show up, and you're like, oh boy. And so you open the door, but you, some of you, you, you've installed a screen door just for this reason. You've told everybody else it's you don't want the flies in, but here's the reality is you got some other people you don't want in. So you open the door, you leave the screen shut, and you're gonna talk to them, talk to them through the screen. You just kind of, yeah, you just stand out there. We're gonna stay here and just have a little conversation. And, and you kind of, you don't want them at home in your home, so you let them know. Well, there's others that you're like, you know, I might spend a little more time with them and I don't, don't want them just to, but I'll, I'll open the screen, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep you on the, Come on, some of you got that little tile entryway. 
And you're just going to keep them right there? Just kind of, yep, uh-huh, uh-huh, we're going to keep you on the table. We'll have a little conversation, but you're not coming in. You're not going to dwell in my house. You're not going to make yourself at home here today. And we're just going to give them that signal. Come on, are you with me? But then I, every single one of you got them friends. Come on, you know them friends. Pastor Donnie Young was here with us uh, first service for a little bit, and they're those kinds of friends. You know how Donnie knows I'm at his house? Because I've already come in, and I'm in the kitchen making myself something to eat, and I yell upstairs, hey, Donnie, I'm in your house. Why? Because I can make myself at home there. I just, I let myself in. I could, I wander all around their house. The other day, I was in there, they have one of them fancy, uh, Tatum, what are those things? An intercom. Yeah, they got an intercom. They never figure out how to work how it worked. I said, this is how at home I am. They're all, they don't even know I'm there. So I got an intercom. I go, uh, dear young family, checking dear young family, Chris Norman's in the lobby waiting for you. I mean, that's how, how at home I am there. Now listen, listen, listen. <laughs> the people feel at home, they always, they always end up in your kitchen, don't they? They're going through your fridge. Now watch. I think a lot of us do this with Jesus. And if you want to live a full life, you, you've got to address this. Oh, Jesus. Good to see you today. Uh, the screen is here for a reason. <laughs> let's keep you, let's just keep you. Oh, oh, you want to come in. Oh, you're, you are coming. Okay, you're coming in. Jesus, you're coming. Uh, let's just keep you, let's keep you here in this, uh, this little tile entryway. Because I, oh, oh, gee, don't push. Don't push past the tile. Don't push past the tile. Okay, Jesus, you know, I got this. Uh, the TV's on in the other room. And I don't think you're going to like the program. Jesus, there's a, there's a closet that uh, you definitely don't want to find. I'm, I'm telling you, if you could just stay here on the tile in this entryway, we'd be good. Like, let's have this relationship, Jesus. Let's just keep you here, you know. We're good, right? We're going to keep you. She's going, well, can, can we? And you just, no. Oh, Jesus, so you don't, you don't understand. I, everybody has one of these. I have, I have a, two of them. They're called junk drawers. And there's just some things, these vices in my life that I kind of hide in there. And I, I don't know if I'll ever have the strength to move past some of this stuff in my life. And so we just kind of hide it there. You definitely don't want to see that, Jesus. You definitely, you, so let's just keep you here, you see. But, but Paul says, Scripture says, if you're going to live in fullness of life, it happens when Jesus comes into every area of your life, that he is at home, at home, that he dwells in every aspect of your life. So when you go to Jesus and you're, and you're saying, Jesus, you don't understand the closet. Like there's things I've done I can't escape. There's a guilt I feel that I wear because of what's happened. And I put it in that closet. Jesus, don't you dare open that closet. I don't think I can handle it, Jesus. You, you don't know those things have marked me forever. Jesus walks up. He wants to open the closet because he's going to tell you this. In Corinthians, he says that in Christ, old things have passed away and all things have become new. You're never going to actually know what it is to live a new life until you actually let Jesus into all those broken places inside your life. And you find out that he could meet you and, and, and fill you and, and strengthen. Well, Jesus, the junk drawer, I mean, how are we going to deal with that? I, I've tried. Now, I've gone to counseling. I've, I've even tried you, Jesus. I've tried you, Jesus. Friends, you don't try Jesus. You either make him Lord of all or not at all. There's no trying Jesus. So Jesus goes, if you make me Lord, here's what I'll tell you. We'll do with some of that junk in your junk drawer. I know you think you're weak, but 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So I know you're weak, but I'm not. I know you don't think you got this, but I can help you. Well, Jesus, and here's where a lot of us are not close. Here's what I've heard about you, is that you get all up in someone's house and you start rearranging furniture. You start moving this to there and you're putting that and your pictures are this. And I just don't know if I could handle that. Like, like what if you mess up my feng shui? I've worked hard on this feng shui. What are you going to do? Like, what's it going to look like when it's all done? I don't know if I can trust you. Well, Jeremiah 29, 11, friends, tells us exactly what he does in the home of a person who allows Jesus to do his thing. I know the plans I have toward you, declares the Lord. I'm going to prosper you, not harm you. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you a future. You know what your life is going to look like when I'm done? It's going to look like hope. It's going to look like future. It's going to look good. It's going to be the best. 
telling you, friends, guard your heart. So, you got to know that the enemy is always trying to, to, he's always trying to hold you back from everything God wants to bring you into. And what I just want to challenge you on in this season is going, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take guarding my heart serious. I'm going to keep myself in this place, a willing heart, just open. Jesus, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? What do you want to speak to? Jesus, what do you want to address in my life? And friends, here's what you need to understand. There is no room in your life that Jesus can't handle. There's no crevice worth hiding. There's no heart he can't heal or mend or strengthen. There's no life that Jesus can't restore. Your job is just to be willing. Say, all right, I surrender. I surrender. And when you do, he goes to work at molding and shaping you. He says that you'll discover a love that is beyond knowing. What does that mean? It's like the universe. The more we discover about the universe, the more we discover that there's more to discover about the universe. The more you discover about God's love is the more you discover that there's more to discover about God's love. You end up in this vicious cycle of God just working and loving on you over and over again. I just want to invite you into it. In Jesus' name, guard your heart. Church, will you pray with me? God, thank you that you've not left us to ourselves, that you desire to work inside of every single one of our lives. I thank you that your work is good, your word is good. But God, sometimes our heart is just in the wrong spot and we've allowed it to be there maybe for a really long time. But God, we're here today uh, saying that we wanna take a step forward. We might not have it all figured out, but God, we're gonna just take a step today toward you. So God, for those with hard hearts, I pray that you'd give them the strength, God, just to start softening their heart toward you. God, those who have, have lived with this faint heart, God, they get into trials and they back down. God, I pray that you would help them in those moments to lean into you more than they ever have in their lives, God. Those that have a neglected heart that are allowing things in their life that shouldn't be in their life, God, today, would you give them the strength to address those things, confess those things. When we confess our sin, you tell us that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, would you move us all to the place where we just stay willing, a willing heart, open to you every moment, every day, pursuing you with everything that's in us. Listen, I know right now there's some of you that came in this place and your heart maybe hasn't been in the right spot. I want to speak specifically to those of you who've come in here and you've never, you've never committed your life to Jesus. You've never said yes to him. Maybe, maybe you had once when you were a child, but you've turned your back on Jesus and you're here today realizing that you need to finally surrender to say yes to him. Well, listen, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to him today. I'd love to lead you in a word of prayer, prayer simply talking with God. And in this prayer, I'm going to ask that you just surrender to him. Maybe there's those of you like you, you've got that hard heart or that faith. Would you, you can say this prayer is along with me as well. And just committing to the Lord a, a, a soft heart, a, a willing heart today. And so come on, if that's you, would you let me lead you in a word of prayer? Come on, here's what you tell Jesus. Tell him. Say, God, I thank you that you love me right where I am. But I know that you have so much more for me. And so today. I choose to surrender my life to you. I thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross on my behalf, giving your life in my place so that I can be forgiven. God, would you forgive me today? I thank you, Jesus, for rising from the grave to lead me into life. Would you fill me with your spirit and help me to walk with you all the days of my life? So be my Lord be my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone agree together and set a good hearty. Come on church, amen and amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. And if you made that decision to accept Christ into your life, or you'd like any more information about Citizens Church, then you can text CITIZENS to 55498. That's CITIZENS, all lowercase, to 55498. And secondly, if you would like to give to the mission here at Citizens, then you can text I give, all one word, I give to 55498 or visit citizenschurch.org slash giving. 
Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all the content we produce throughout the week. We love you guys and we can't wait to see you next time.